Let's pray as we open up the word. Father God, we thank you for the privilege that you recorded and protected and preserved stories for us so that we really can understand more about who you are. We ask, Holy Spirit, that you would break the bread for us this morning. Feed our hearts and our souls. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, On Friday, I mentioned um, an Easter pageant that we used to participate in. And for for a number of years, the church where we were attending at that time we held this wonderful dramatisation of the Easter story. There were Roman soldiers and Lazarus rose from the dead and Palm Sunday and Easter morning. It was a panoramic view of the story of Easter. And one year, the lady who was directing all of this went away during the lead up for some reason. And I don't even remember how, but there were a few things that she wanted me to help with while she was away. And um, most of them I could sort, but but she said that the lady who was doing the role of Mary Magdalene was not available this year. Um, There was a scene where Mary Magdalene did this beautiful creative dance outside the tomb. It was a lament before the point of discovery where she met the gardener who was actually the risen Jesus. And this lady said to me, I haven't got anyone for this role, so do that. Pray about it, and I'm sure it'll be okay. I prayed, and a name did actually come to my mind. But, well, it was awkward, because I didn't know her that well. I was shy, and her husband was a gruff Scotsman. So I prayed again, hoping for another name, I guess. Um, But no other name came. This was all I was getting. Her daughter danced with my daughter, and... um But Highland dancing wasn't really what we were going for. Um, And we didn't cross paths that that all very often. But I thought it would be convenient if we bumped into each other. But I didn't see her at any drop-offs or pickups. I had her number. So I rang her a few times, but no answer. Time was ticking. I was avoiding this, but I needed someone for this role. Ah. So the next time I rang, her husband answered the phone. So I took a deep breath and I tried to explain the weird nature of my phone call. I was just wondering if Lisa would be interested in doing this. The phone went silent and I thought, oh my goodness, I've made him mad. (laughs) And then he said, how did you know? I know what? He said, Lisa is a dancer. She was a member of the Queensland Ballet Company. She auditioned for some very significant roles with some others as well. She's very, very good, but she doesn't really talk about that part of her life anymore. How did you know? How did I know? I didn't know. I knew nothing. I had nothing. And I felt like Jesus was standing on the shore to some fishermen in a boat. Throw your net over the other side, he said, and you will catch what you're looking for. And I will say, the way this lady danced and engaged in that beautiful scene was just amazing. It was perfect. And it was probably my favourite part of the whole thing. And I still shake my head. How is that even possible? But it is, this is the, our privilege of serving a God who is alive, who is with us. We get to be part of remarkable things. Today is Resurrection Sunday. This is the day we celebrate that Jesus who died is now alive. He is risen. He is alive. And this morning, we're still mindful of some of those phrases out of Isaiah 52 and 53, where the prophet declares, Awake! A redeemer is coming. Burst into songs of joy together, you ruins of Jerusalem, for the Lord has comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. He was despised and rejected by mankind. He was a man of suffering and familiar with pain. 
And after he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many and he will bear their iniquities. Jesus lived a life familiar with pain and suffering. He encountered all of the things that cause our failures, even though he never succumbed to those things himself, so that he would be able to stand as our high priest and intercede for us. And he died submitting to those realities as well. He was buried in a garden that belonged to Joseph of Arimathea, a member of the Jewish Sanhedrin. This garden had been prepared for Joseph's own entombment, but after Jesus died, he personally approached the Roman prefect Pontius Pilate to have access to the body of Jesus. And together with Nicodemus, another member of the Sanhedrin, Jesus was embalmed according to Jewish burial customs. That was Friday. By six o'clock Friday evening, All Jesus' family, his disciples and friends, they went to their homes because the Sabbath rest had started. But curiously, this year, some of the Sanhedrin were less strict about the Sabbath. A contingent of elders went went with the chief priests on Saturday to, to negotiate with the Romans to have a royal seal placed over the stone at the entrance of Jesus' tomb, and a guard was put in place. They didn't want a rumour getting around that Jesus had risen from the dead, just like he said he would. See, they knew what Jesus had said. They had no doubt that Jesus had claimed up front that he would rise from the dead. And we know early Sunday morning, Jesus did rise. The stone was rolled away by an angel, not to let Jesus out, but so that those who came to visit the tomb could see in, so that they could witness what had happened, so that they would understand that the tomb was indeed empty. Then there was this process of discovery. Those who were with Jesus were on a journey of revelation, not just to realise that the tomb was empty, but it was empty because someone who is alive doesn't need to stay in that place of death anymore. The women who followed Jesus and supported Jesus in his ministry They were the first to witness this. They went there to minister and to grieve. And on the way to the tomb, they realised they hadn't really sought this through. How would they move a stone that took strong men to position it over the mouth of the sepulchre? But when they arrived, they were shocked to see an open tomb with nobody. And then the disciples When they heard the women's report, at first they thought they were crazy, even crazed by grief. But they checked it out for themselves. Yep, the body is gone. And then other stories started to trickle in. Mary Magdalene was the first as she wept privately in the garden by the tomb. She met Jesus. Some of the other women met angels who told them that you don't seek the living among the dead. Jesus was not there. Then Jesus spoke with Simon Peter and two followers who were finally walking home to Emmaus after this harrowing weekend in Jerusalem, they also met Jesus on the road. Then there was family, the brother of Jesus, James. Jesus met privately with him. Then when all the other disciples were together, all this occurred... In one day, Sunday, the horror of Friday is being exchanged for joy on Sunday. The despair of death is being exchanged for life on Sunday. The pain of suffering is being exchanged for wholeness and peace and hope on Sunday. What a beautiful discovery to make. The things Jesus had said, 
They were not just metaphorical. They were not just referring to eternal life in heaven outside of this down to earth, in the dust, in the suffering sort of life. This was real. This was happening. Jesus was alive. But there's something that I noticed as I reflected on these incredible stories of love and discovery, of being reunited. Something keeps happening that I find rather intriguing. They keep having encounters with Jesus over food. So we're going to look at some of these accounts this morning. And the first story is of two friends, followers of Jesus, one whose name was Cleopas, and they're walking home from Jerusalem to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles, and they're going over what has happened during the weekend. So let's read that out of Luke 24, from verse 15. As they walked and discussed these things with each each other, Jesus himself came up and walked alongside them, but they were kept from recognising him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know these things that have happened here these last days? What things, he asked. Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is now the third day since this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but they didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. He said to them, how foolish you are. How slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he was going further. But they urged him strongly, stay with us for it is nearly evening and the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, he gave thanks, broke it and began to give it to them. Their eyes were opened and they recognised him and, they, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us as we talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. These two men are still reeling from the harrowing weekend in Jerusalem. The distress of Friday has not diminished. The death of Jesus has not faded. They're still trying to grasp what had happened. They're working out what was real, what was not, why it went down the way it went down. And it doesn't make sense to them. The women said angels at the tomb had told them he was not there. Spurgeon was a famous Bible teacher, and there's something that he said about this. He said, he has risen. He is not here. That is the epitaph described on Christ's tombs. On other people's graves, it is written, here lies so-and-so. But on Christ's tomb, it is recorded, he is not here. The angels told the women, you don't seek the living among the dead. Riddles. It was so confusing. So what has happened? Where was he? And then a stranger joins these two companions in their contemplations as they walk along the road, sifting through all of this. 
And as he joins their discussion, rather than contradicting their faith, this stranger explains how everything had happened and it was actually an incredible fulfilment of the amazing narrative of scripture. There are some remarkable insights offered. He talks to them about the meaning of what the prophets wrote. He explains things in a way that makes sense. The Christ, Messiah, was not a political manoeuvre to redeem Israel from Rome, but there was a bigger plan that God had clearly articulated throughout Scripture. What this stranger said had made so much sense. Their confusion is lifting. They are beginning to see how these events were fitting into what they already knew in Scripture. And when they arrive home, they invite this stranger to sit down with them to dine, the ritual of sharing hospitality over a meal. And it is here that they make the most astounding discovery. Their eyes are opened and they see who had been with them all along. They see Jesus, not a stranger. He had been the one who had been journeying with them all along. So what was it about this act of eating together, breaking bread together that opened their eyes? Certainly the Holy Spirit can and does conceal and reveal things to us at the perfect time. But there's another idea that I love. As they sit down together, they invite Jesus to give thanks. He takes the bread and their eyes are focused on their guest performing this ritual of fellowship. His hands turn to break the bread. Ah, those hands had scars, scars that are a mark of his suffering. And they saw those hands breaking bread and they realise, they recognise Jesus, Jesus alive here, flesh and blood. It was like the sun exploded in their minds. Everything he said was opened up to them. Light shone in the darkness. I enjoy the way they describe this encounter. Were not our hearts burning within us? That is true heartburn. Yes on fire, alive, activated at the core of who we are, so alive, alive as they walk along the dusty road together, alive as they urge this stranger to join them for dinner. And then almost as immediately, just as they realise, Jesus disappears. He was here and then he was not. Flesh and blood, and yet now not subject to the same limitations of mortal humanity as we are, a resurrected body. So now they get up and they rush back to Jerusalem straight away. Hunger, gone, even though they hadn't actually eaten. Weariness, gone, even though they had not rested. There was something that they now know that they weren't sure of before. Jesus is alive and they are loved and loved and loved. This discovery changes everything. So let's read what happens as they go back to Jerusalem. Verse 33, they got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. And there they found the 11 and those with them assembled together. And they were saying, it's true. The Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. And while they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. And they were startled and frightened, thinking they were seeing a ghost. He said to them, why are you troubled? Why do doubts rise in your mind? Look at my hands and my feet. It is myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones. As you see, I have. And when he had said this, he showed, him, showed them his hands and feet. And while they still did not believe it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, do you have anything here to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish. And he took it and he ate it in their presence. 
And he said to them, this is what I told you about while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms. And he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. And he told them, this is what was written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. Cleopas and his friend find the other disciples. Their incredible revelation has been met with other confirmations of the women's story. Jesus had met with Simon P Peter. All this in one day. Sunday. And they, as they excitedly talk about this and what it might mean, Jesus is standing right there among them. Shalom, peace be with you, he says. But they are not peaceful. How could this really be Jesus? Friday he was crucified, yesterday he was dead. How could someone come in through locked doors? This is terrifying. They thought they were seeing a ghost. Jesus gently reassures them, all the while taking them on a roller coaster ride of discovery. Hear, see, touch, explore. This is me. This is real. I really am alive, not dead, not a ghost. And Jesus encourages them to investigate. Check it out. Explore what they are seeing so that they can be sure, they can be confident. I can almost imagine Jesus shaking his head with a smile and thinking, what's it going to take to convince these guys I'm the real deal? Like, not an apparition. This is really me. Back to basics. Food. A ghost doesn't have a body. But Jesus did. So, let's eat. He ate in front of them and they watched. These men had eaten together nearly every day during the last three years. Yet this was an unusual show-and-tell session. The fish Jesus ate didn't fall out the back of his throat. It was normal, very normal, except it wasn't. Yesterday he was dead, and now he is alive, eating food. Hmm. Again, Jesus opens their minds. It's not just about eating food with them, but offering spiritual sustenance. It was gentle and profound, like a floodgate being wound open, letting the water of life rush through them. This was not just facts about scripture or theology or prophecy. This was a heart revelation so that they would know that they are loved and loved and loved this is what I was telling you about, he says. This is what was written in the prophets. This is what they were telling you about. This is what it looks like on the ground. And, and the most amazing of all, Jesus tells them, you are witnesses of these things. I'm commissioning you to share what you have experienced with others. Not just facts and figures, but the love Yes, the love. There's another account where Jesus appears to the disciples. And we're going to read that out of John chapter 21. Afterwards, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. And they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realise it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, have you got any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple who Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him for he'd taken it off and he jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from the shore, about a hundred yards. 
And when they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you've just caught. So Simon and Peter climbed back into the boat, dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153. But even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread, gave it to them, and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. Jesus is alive. They know that now. But this is a strange place to be, perplexing. They didn't know when or where they would see Jesus next. It was amazing and incredible, yes. But it also would have been weird for them as well. Jesus coming and going without announcement, disappearing from behind locked doors. The disciples were restless in this in-between place, disturbed, unsettled. So Peter makes a decision. He's going fishing. At least three of this group were experienced fishermen. They had been in business together, commercial fishermen. Activity could fill the hours, going back to the familiar when everything was so strange and unfamiliar. But when they did, they had a bad night of it. All night, no fish. Barrenness. Remember the story of the fig tree? The promise of fruit, but no fruit, just leaves. This is where they were at. They were putting in the effort, but not getting the results. Then someone they didn't recognise calls to them from the shore and makes an exchange. Throw your net onto the right side. Jesus gave them a strategy that in the natural does not make any sense. One side of the boat over another when it's the same water all around them. But as they do so, they are swamped with generosity, exchanging barrenness for fruitfulness. They are swamped with fruitfulness that they couldn't achieve on their own, fruitfulness that did not even tear their nets, fruitfulness that came directly from the words of Jesus. This is not the first time this type of miracle has happened for Peter. Last time, Jesus called him to follow him to be a fisherman of people. Perhaps this event was a reminder of that call. God hasn't changed his mind. It still applies after all that had happened over the weekend. It still applies. Something else is exchanged that morning. They were sparked to life after a dreary, empty night. Restlessness is gone. Certainty and confidence takes its place. Peter jumps out of the boat and swims ashore. This wasn't about fishing. This was about meeting Jesus wherever and whatever they are doing. One hard, long, empty night turns into an incredible morning of blessing because Jesus is there. Campbell Morgan says this, Jesus came to them and in effect said, if you are going fishing and you've had a bad night, I can give you a good morning. The difference between night and morning in this story is Jesus revealing himself. Not the number of the fish in the net, although that happened as well. Jesus exchange the restlessness to certainty, to purpose, to togetherness. He turned up and revealed himself to them. And then Jesus calls them to have breakfast together. He calls them to fellowship, food, sharing. He's lit a fire. He's cooked some fresh bread and some fish over the coals. Simon brings more fish, fresh from the nets. And then Jesus waits on them. He serves them breakfast. The night before he died, they shared Passover feast together. Jesus washed the disciples' feet like a slave. Here, he carries the freshly cooked bread 
around to each of them. Then he served some barbecued fish that he cooked himself. The risen Christ, straight from the courts of heaven, waits on his friends like a servant. He cooks for them. He serves them. He dines with them. What happened a few days ago? Betrayal, abandonment, denial, suffering, doubt. And these men, his closest disciples, were contributors of this pain as much as the Jewish elders or the Romans. This is not ancient history. This just happened the other day. Yet Jesus doesn't have a go at them. He doesn't debrief them. He doesn't lecture them. He doesn't call them out. He doesn't rebuke or dress them down. In fact, if we notice the text, he doesn't even bring it up. Instead, he joins them for breakfast and they dine together so that they know, they know that they are loved and loved and loved. We've talked about how breaking bread symbolises unity and reconciliation by sharing a meal. Breaking bread together represented joining with someone in fellowship and forgiveness. Breaking bread meant coming together, sitting down together after separation, setting aside the conflict or whatever differences was causing the problem. It's coming back together into fellowship again. It's a way to express unity, togetherness, Harmony, agreement, peace. Jesus was breaking bread together with his disciples. Not just at the Last Supper, he was now doing this on the beach beside the Sea of Galilee. The weekend was over. A new season, a new start, a new way of being together was being acknowledged. At the Last Supper, Jesus said breaking bread was representative of a new covenant between God and his followers. Yet his body had suffered, broken by the process of crucifixion. Yet here he was, that same body restored, resurrected and alive, demonstrating by example how this new covenant looks like in real life. The Jesus who dines with us is the God who gives us another go, another chance, another opportunity together in unity, partnering and working together with him to accomplish all of the good things that God has for us to achieve. Incredible, incredible story. Isn't that good? that we get to revisit these stories every year at Easter. Let's just ask some questions around this now, the things we've been thinking about. When was it that I really realised that Jesus was alive? Is there something about my relationship with Jesus that I still need to look at? touch or explore? What is it like to realise that Jesus encourages investigating our faith? What part can I play in living at peace with others? Is there someone I need to cook breakfast for, so to speak? When was the last time I really experienced that Holy Spirit heartburn which inspires and energises me? Do I understand that I am loved and loved and loved? Is there someone I can share the work of God in my life with as God gives me opportunity? As I think about that, What names and faces come to my mind? Jesus, our Lord, is alive. He is resurrected from the dead. And in those first days after that weekend, the disciples were discovering this incredible news. Jesus was not in the tomb where he was buried. He was now walking out that new covenant with his people. 
a covenant of love and grace sealed by his presentation of the sacrifice as our high priest, forgiven, restored, commissioned. It was a revelation that we are loved and loved and loved. When I was working as a student midwife, the matron of the unit where I was working, her name was Sister Nolan. She had trained in the military. She was tough and she was severe. And one shift, I was sitting in the nursery on, the, on a bench seat lined up on, against the wall, lined up like birds on a wire with everybody else, bottle feeding newborn babies, shoulder to shoulder, because that's what we did then. And suddenly, as I'm doing this, I had this overwhelming experience of being loved by God. I've spoken to other people who've had this experience as well, completely immersed, drenched in the love of God. And I was trying not to overthink it, like, why here, in the middle of bottles and burping babies and soothing colic? Loved and loved and loved and loved. And then Sister Nolan came in on her rounds And she made some perfunctory comment and then she stopped and stared at me. And what she said really struck me. She said, oh, Sister Harris, look at you. You look beautiful. She said this, really beautiful. Your face, it is, she shook her head amazed. She didn't have words. What could I say? She was seeing Jesus, I know that. But her comment made me aware that God on the inside leaks out onto the outside. We were surrounded by so many staff and I didn't want to discuss this with her. I didn't want to move. I wanted to stay there in that tangible revelation of God's love for as long as I could. And we can do that. We can do that because Jesus is alive. Jesus meets with his followers, drawing them back into a revelation that all the stuff that happened was really covered with his forgiveness. It really was covered with his love. Jesus breaks bread with them so that they know, they really know that they are loved and loved, and loved, and loved. He joins with them, serves them, being in fellowship together with them. Jesus is the one who dines with us. Let's pray. Father God, how incredible that you did not stay dead, Jesus, that you rose from the dead with a body, with a body that ate food, walked in the dust, was alive. And we thank you so much for that reality. And I get it that it's confusing and it's hard to wrap our head around because we're subject to mortality ourselves. But Father, we thank you that you are the resurrection and the life. You are the one who calls us to be people who are witnesses of these things. Father, that you are the God who loves and loves and loves and loves and you want us to be people who will serve the bread and the fish and be people who would minister love and grace, unity and reconciliation wherever we are. We thank you, Father God, for your grace and your victory. We thank you for you just being you. And we lift your name up high this morning, Jesus. We praise your name. We thank you. And we declare Jesus is alive. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Bless you.